In 1978, Mafia Supremo Gaetano Badalamenti is running one of the largest transcontinental crime rings the US and Europe has ever seen. This same year, the bloody remains of former family friend and political activist Giuseppe Peppino Impastato are found on a Sicilian railway line. Authorities declare his death is as a result of a failed terrorist attempt or suicide, a conclusion his supporters firmly reject. Evidente che c'era stata la decisione da parte di Badalamenti di volere la morte di Peppino. It will take a quarter of a century for Peppino's family to finally face Badalamenti in court. No, no, vendetta no. Pino Impastato is born in the pretty coastal town of Cinisi in Sicily's northwest in 1948. Like many in Sicily at the time, his father Luigi has links to the local mafia. He counts among his friends and neighbors a local mafia enforcer, Gaetano Badalamenti. Both work for Peppino's uncle, the mafia boss, Cesare Manzella. Dirigeva tutta l'organizzazione mafiosa. Diciamo lo zio, il nonno, il fratello del Paggio, che erano tutti mafiosi. Per noi erano persone che ammiravamo tantissimo, ci proteggevano, non ci facevano mancare nulla. The young Peppino is particularly close to his uncle and grows up on the Manzella farm with his parents Luigi and Felicia and younger brother Giovanni. But in 1963, a horrific event changes the two brothers' whole attitude to the mob. Their uncle Cesare is blown up by a car bomb. Da quel momento in poi inizia, dico finisce la nostra infanzia, diventiamo subito grande, inizia la nostra sofferenza. È il nostro percorso di impegno perché abbiamo capito che la mafia non era qualcosa di positivo. Peppino si è espresso in sé, questa è mafia. Io per tutta la vita mi batterò contro. Eh. But Gaetano Badalamenti has a very different reaction. For him, Manzella's death is an opportunity. He now takes control of the Cinisi Mafia, and it makes him rich. His businesses start getting lucrative construction contracts from the local government, including the expansion of Palermo's airport, which helps his own growing drug trafficking business between Sicily and the US. The two men, Peppino and Parlamenti, who had once been friends, find themselves on a course that will see them come to blows for nearly 15 years. because Peppino devotes himself to a whole host of anti-mafia causes. He founds an anti-mafia radio station. He runs an anti-mafia newspaper. He holds impromptu anti-mafia gatherings in Tinisi's town square. And the target of many of his attacks is his neighbor and former family friend, Gaetano Badalamenti. 
I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. In his satirical radio broadcasts, Peppino ridicules him while accusing him of corruption and drug trafficking. Parola di Tano Seduto, grande capo di Mafiopo. E ci sarà, ci sarà un porticciolo bellissimo. Potremo sistemare le nostre veloci canoe che porteranno al di là del mare la sabbia bianca. Le nostre canoe cariche di eroiche, di eroiche. In quel periodo, pensate un po', negli anni 60, che parlare di mafia era impossibile. Questi erano mossi sacri, per molti la mafia non esisteva e già Peppino lanciava le sue prime accuse dirette. Despite the obvious risks of taking on the mafia, Peppino's mother stands up for him. Lei era una donna non colta. Non era colta mia madre, però molto intelligente, era sensibile e intelligente. Mia madre poi subito ha capito che le scelte di Peppino erano quelle giuste. For Peppino's father Luigi, a low-ranking member of the Cinisi mafia, Peppino's behavior puts him in a difficult and dangerous position. In 1977, Luigi is walking home from work. When he is hit by a car and killed in an apparent accident. Then, eight months later. At dawn on May the 9th, 1978, the Carabinieri, the local police, are called to a secluded spot on the outskirts of Tinisi. A section of railway track has been blown apart. A man's bloody remains are scattered over a 300 meter area. They are the remains of Peppino Impastato. Umberto Santino is another political activist from nearby Palermo. Quando abbiamo saputo uh, del, di cosa era accaduto, io, mia moglie e altri siamo precipitati a Cinisi. Abbiamo visto che c'era una situazione terribile, cioè si parlava di terrorismo, di suicidio. The local police offer two explanations. Either Peppino has accidentally killed himself while planting a bomb, or he's committed suicide. And local newspapers support their claims. One headline reads, leftist fanatic blown apart by own bomb on railway track. Peppino's friends, however, are convinced these claims make no sense. Peppino era uno che amava, era un pacifista, era uno che amava l'ironia, amava essere clownesco, e, lungi dall'essere violento. Though. Ma abbiamo capito subito parlando con dei compagni che si trattava di un omicidio dopo. Their suspicions are further raised when they find blood inside a small shack, just yards from the railway line. The shack's entrance points away from the railway tracks. There is no way the blood could have got in there as a result of the explosion. So how has it got there? Io arrivai subito dopo perché ero militare in quel periodo, i compagni di Peppino trovarono subito le pietre insanguinate col sangue di Peppino in tutt'altro luogo. Amidst the circulating rumors and suspicions about how he died, Peppino's funeral on the 10th of May is a massive outpouring of grief and anger. A multitude turn out in support of the anti-mafia campaigner. Il funerale è stato una vera e propria manifestazione, un vero e proprio corteo, oggi paragonabile ai cortei che si fanno per gli scioperi, quindi c'era parecchia gente. Molta emozione. 
eravamo più di 2000 persone, ma è stato un punto di partenza per dire alla mafia che noi non ci rassegniamo, noi continueremo. Abbiamo avuto, siamo andati proprio davanti a casa Badalamenti, proprio a gridare proprio lì davanti, a indicarlo come l'assassino di Peppino. Ecco, e quello è stato un segnale forte. Peppino's mother, Felicia, and brother Giovanni, together with Umberto Santino, now resolve to uncover the truth. Ignoring continuing dangers, Santino, with the family's support, now begins a campaign to bring Badalamenti to justice. The role that we have had to demonstrate that it was a crime, and so to ask for justice and to save the memory of Peppino with a series of initiatives. Together, they start to gather evidence. Non mi vergogno a dire che ci siamo, ci siamo trasformati noi come familiari assieme ad alcuni compagni di Peppino nella prima fase in investigatori. But finding out what really happened on the night of May the 8th proves very difficult. If the mafia were responsible for Peppino's death, their plan had been very effective. The campaigners believe Peppino's history of political activism provided Badalamenti with the perfect scenario with which to stage his death. In the 1970s, Italy had suffered a wave of violence at the hands of hardline communist groups. He had to pass as a terrorist. And it was not easy to accumulate a militant of the extreme right with a terrorist. Family and friends believe that Badalamenti had used this political climate to make Peppino's death appear as if he had accidentally blown himself up while planting a terrorist bomb. But his family and friends think it would have been totally out of character for him to commit an act of violence, not least because it would have hurt the very workers he often campaigned for. Peppino non avrebbe mai fatto una cosa del genere. Il treno che doveva passare di là era il treno dei pendolari, quello con gli operai, quello che lui, eh, le persone che lui difendeva e che andava a trovare in fabbrica, non avrebbe mai fatto saltare quel treno. Such is Badalamenti's power and influence around Cinisi. The family are convinced that the local police don't want to get to the bottom of what really happened. Diciamo, hanno fatto tutto il possibile per affossare la verità. For six years, the family gets nowhere. Meanwhile, Badalamenti's operation continues to grow. He has become one of the key players of a multi-million dollar heroin trafficking operation that imports heroin from the Middle East and distributes it across America through a chain of pizza parlors. But then there's an unexpected breakthrough for Peppino's family. Federal law enforcement officials are celebrating what they consider to be a major victory in their war against organized crime. A former head of the Sicilian Mafia and 16 other reputed organized crime figures convicted yesterday of running one of the biggest heroin smuggling rings ever uncovered. Badalamenti is tried and found guilty in a New York court for masterminding a nine-year-long $1.65 billion drugs ring, known as the Pizza Connection. The 17-month trial of 22 Sicilian Mafia men turns into a media circus. Badalamenti is the key player in the operation, distributing heroin and cocaine and coordinating a string of violent crimes. In 1987, the 63-year-old Badalamenti is sentenced to 45 years in a US prison. Buoyed by the spectacle of Badalamenti on trial in the US, back in Sicily, Peppino's mother Felicia desperate to bring the killer of her son to justice, decides to write a book. In it, she recalls an incident when her husband was summoned by Badalamenti. 
Luigi impastato, il padre di Peppino, va a casa di Badalamenti e lì evidentemente Badalamenti gli ha detto guarda che con tuo figlio non ne possiamo più. Noi siamo saltati sul tavolo, sulla sedia, quando abbiamo sentito dalla madre di Peppino questo, perché c'era una prova evidente che c'era stata la decisione da parte di Badalamenti di volere la morte di Peppino. Felicia's recollection is clearly significant. But there's still a long way to go to corroborate it. Then, in 1994, with Badalamenti behind bars, they get the witness they need. A member of the Cinesi Mafia, Salvatore Palazzolo, has turned police informant. He claims to have information from a relation and Badalamenti's right-hand man, Vito Palazzolo, about Peppino's death. The family asked the police to confront him. Abbiamo fatto un esposto, l'abbiamo fatto firmare alla madre e abbiamo chiesto alla procura di interrogare questo Salvatore, Salvatore Palazzolo per chiedere se sapeva qualcosa sul diritto impastato. E lui ha detto siamo stati noi. This is the evidence they are looking for. Badalamenti, it seems, really had given an order to kill Peppino. In 1996, nearly 20 years after Peppino's death, a dossier detailing the role of Gaetano Badalamenti in the death of the young activist is presented to the Italian courts. Eventually, the case is reopened. At last, the family can seek justice. Now an elderly woman, Felicia invites television cameras into her home. No, no, vendetta no. Vuoi di giustizia? No, la vendetta è una cosa brutta. Vuoi di giustizia che siano puniti sta gente. Finally, in 2000, the case comes to trial. The family prepare to confront the man they believe to be Peppino's murderer. Inside the court of Palermo, a 77-year-old Gaetano Badalamenti appears from Fairton Prison, New Jersey. Vedevamo in un video, in uno schermo in tempo reale. È stato il primo processo fatto in video collegamento a Palermo. The prosecution aim for maximum impact. They call Felicia as a witness. Un brivido ha percorso naturalmente la schiena di tutti, perché quello era il capo di Cosa Nostra e lei era una povera donna malata e che a stento è arrivata al pretorio perché sostenuta dal, dal figlio da Umberto Santino, ma con un coraggio incredibile. Felicia takes the stand and identifies the murderer of her son. Poi questa donna ha avuto il coraggio durante i processi di puntare il dito su uno dei più grandi boss di allora che era Gaetano Badalamenti. The court is told at length why Badalamenti had a powerful motive for killing Peppino. They hear how Peppino had criticized Badalamenti's business dealings, including his construction company's shady building activities and his drug trafficking business. And significantly, the court is told that in the days leading up to his death, Peppino had been standing as a candidate in the local elections on an anti-mafia ticket. Chiaro che all'interno del Consiglio Comunale, lui sarebbe stato dirompente, avrebbe, diciamo, contato di più, avrebbe avuto un peso per quanto riguarda un po' eh, l'opposizione. If Papino had won the election, it would have given him the means to curb Badalamenti's illicit activities. The prosecution then explains what it thinks really happened to Papino.
on the night of the 8th of May 1978. He had been followed on his drive home after his shift at his radio station, Radio Out. Just a few miles from home, Pepina was pulled from his car and taken to the stone shack close to the railway line. He was then violently beaten with stones. It accounts for the blood splatter found by Pepino's friends in the shack, yet ignored by police. Pepino was then dragged, either semi-conscious or unconscious, to the deserted railway line and laid across the tracks on top of five kilograms of TNT, an explosive often used by Badalamenti's construction companies. The charge was then detonated. Crucially, the court hears that a forensic examination of a stone collected from the shack by one of Pepino's friends on the morning after his death is covered in blood which is an exact match with Pepino's. For Pepino's family, the description of exactly what happened to him is horrific. Io penso che sia veramente difficile poter descrivere queste sensazioni e in particolare quello che si prova di fronte a un atroce delitto compiuto in questo modo. Finally, the prosecution rests. With Badalamenti looking on, his legal counsel now put the case for the defense. La difesa di Gaetano Badalamenti è stata quella dei, classica dei mafiosi, quella dell'estranità totale anche a cosa nostra. Badalamenti denies any association with the Sicilian mafia. It's designed to show he had no motive for killing an anti-mafia campaigner. And he goes a step further. The defense also point out that Badalamenti is an old friend of Peppino's family and could therefore never have hurt him. And they even claim he supported Peppino's politics. But this is refuted by the deposition of mafia informer Salvatore Palazzolo. He flatly contradicts Badalamenti, confirming that he had information from Badalamenti's deputy that the mafia boss had ordered the murder of Peppino Impastato. The jury retire to consider their verdict. After only one day of deliberation, on April the 11th, 2002, the court of Palermo reaches its decision. Gaetano Badalamenti is finally found guilty of the murder of Peppino Impastato. But for the family, there are more mixed feelings. Ho sentito qualche espressione di liberazione da parte di qualcuno, di quelli che seguivano il processo in aula. Noi non abbiamo mai provato odio e vendetta nei loro confronti. Il nostro obiettivo era quello di arrivare alla verità. Badalamenti is given a life sentence. He dies in prison, two years later in 2004, aged 80. Two months after that, Peppino's mother, Felicia, also passes away. But her job is done. She and her family's fight for justice gains legendary status back home. I think that they have done something of great value and great difficulty. They have had to take care of the whole environment of Cinesi and the environment of the mafia. Credo che sia una, una bella storia di orgoglio e di dignità siciliana. 
the story of the Impastato family has become part of Sicilian folklore. It has come to represent the wider fight of ordinary people against the Mafia. Papino has become a true hero, a man who was born into a Mafia family but chose to walk another path. Peppino aveva fatto delle scelte giuste, aveva fatto delle scelte proprio che erano scelte di civiltà, di democrazia. Non ci sono altri casi di, di persone che hanno lottato radicalmente contro la mafia e hanno perso anche la vita che provenissero da una famiglia mafiosa. La radicalità nell'attaccare la mafia, ma anche l'intelligenza con cui lo faceva. In the days following his death, the doors of the impastato home were thrown open to the anti-mafia movement. Today they remain open as a permanent memorial to Peppino Impastato and as a reminder of how a family bravely stood up to the Sicilian Mafia. At first glance, 69-year-old great-grandmother Faye Copeland seems a most unlikely criminal. But in November 1990, she takes the stand in a murder trial that shocks the state of Missouri. We didn't think Mom had anything to do with it. Faye Copeland and her 76-year-old husband, Ray, are accused of tricking five homeless drifters into an elaborate cattle rustling scam before murdering them. Well, you won't find no bodies. I think the community kind of found it hard to believe. It's a story of missing people, dark family secrets, and cold-blooded murder. The question the trial must answer, is Faye Copeland a killer or a victim herself? Livingston County, in northwest Missouri. This quiet community is scattered over miles of cattle pastures and farmland. The only city, Chillicothe, has a population of just nine and a half thousand. It's a small enough community that we all know our neighbors and uh, we all watch after each other, watch after our property and things like that. And I'm sure most people never lock their doors. But in the fall of 1986, something menacing unsettles the people of this peaceful rural area. A deputy from a neighboring county visits Livingston County Deputy Gary Calvert. He's looking for a cattle thief. He was working on a fraudulent check investigation where a Dennis Murphy had written a check for the purchase of some cows. And his information was those cows were taken from the sale barn in a trailer owned by Ray Copeland. Now in his 70s, local resident Ray Copeland has raised five children with his wife, Faye. He considered himself a handyman. He painted barns, buildings. He mowed, sprayed for people. If he wanted to work for you or something, he was fairly friendly. But if he didn't, and he was around him much. And he was kind of a growly old man. Faye so was a typical farm wife. Uh, she worked in town in Chillicothe. Gary Calvert and the visiting deputy sheriff drive out to Ray Copeland's farm. They hope he might be able to help them find Dennis Murphy, the drifter accused of writing the bad check. Mr. Copeland's response was that yes, he had helped him haul some cattle. He needed some place to store these cattle for a few days. And then this Dennis Murphy guy took the cows and left, and he didn't know where he was at or any, any more information about him. Gary Calvert thinks nothing more of it, 
until a deputy from a nearby county comes looking for another drifter named Wayne Warner. He had also bought cattle with a bad check, and again, they'd been hauled away by Ray Copeland. Well, I suggested those deputies get the statements from, these, from Mr. Warner and Mr. Murphy. You know, if, if, they in, if they include that Ray Copeland was involved somehow, let me know and we'll help you with the investigation. The problem is, the sheriffs can't find Murphy or Warner. Since they're known drifters, it's assumed they've simply moved on. The investigation into the cattle scam goes cold. Then, three years later, in August 1989, a call is made to the Nebraska Highway Patrol hotline. The caller claims a farmer from Livingston County, Missouri, forced him to buy cattle with bad checks. But then he makes an extraordinary allegation, that he'd seen human remains on the farmer's land, and he was terrified. The caller is yet another homeless drifter, Jack McCormick, and the farmer he is talking about is Ray Copeland. McCormick tells police he first met Ray Copeland at a church mission in Springfield, Missouri. Ray had told him that he would pay him $50 a day if he would assist him in buying cattle. Copeland also promised him full board and lodging. To the homeless McCormick, it sounded like a way out of his desperate straits, so he accepted. First, Copeland took McCormick to the bank and advanced him $200 to open a checking account. Then they went to the livestock market. Copeland told McCormick to bid on the cattle because he was too deaf to hear the auctioneer. McCormick had to pay for the cattle with starter checks from his new bank account. They made their first purchase for $2,000 and hauled away the cattle. But McCormick was worried. He knew there was only $200 in his account and that the check would bounce, leaving him to take the rap. He tells investigators that once back at the Copeland farm, he felt increasingly uneasy and that the farmer's wife, Faye, watched him like a hawk. A few days later, McCormick says he saw what appeared to be human bones near a barn and if that wasn't enough to scare him, then came an incident that made him fear for his life. Ray had told him there was a raccoon in the barn and he wanted to kill this raccoon and he needed Jack's assistance. So Ray had a 22 rifle in his hand. He went out to the barn. Ray gave him a stick and said, poke this stick in behind this stack of hay here, try to get that raccoon to come out and I'll shoot him. You sure he's in here? He's in there. I saw him go in there. McCormick sensed something was very wrong. He turned to see Ray Copeland's gun pointing straight at him. Later, Jack McCormick vividly recounted that day in the barn. I never did take my eyes off of him. I'm looking back up at him all the time. I didn't want to run off because I was afraid he would shoot me then, you know, at that point. Petrified, McCormick persuaded Copeland to take him to a nearby town. And there, he made his escape. After hearing Jack McCormick's horrifying story, Gary Calvert revisits the cases of missing drifters Dennis Murphy and Wayne Warner. He checks to see if there's any sign of their activities by examining their bank accounts, driver's licenses, and social security records. But the men seem to have vanished without a trace. With an emerging pattern of bad checks, two missing drifters, and Jack McCormick's statement suggesting foul play, sheriffs obtain a search warrant for the Copeland farm. On October the 9th, 1989, Faye and Ray Copeland are arrested. Initially, the charges are conspiracy to commit theft, in reference to Murphy and Warner's fraudulent checks. 
Just before the arrests, Ray and Faye's son, Al Copeland, and his wife sense something strange is going on. The day before they were arrested, uh, they were over at our house, mom and dad both. And uh, mom wanted to say something. Never did, was able to say anything. And the only thing we heard was the uh, dad telling her to shut up and let's go. I knew something was going on. Deputy Gary Calvert interviews Ray Copeland about the two missing drifters, but he denies any knowledge of their whereabouts. So you didn't have anything to do with their disappearance? I have. Faye Copeland makes the same claim. Faye never really said anything. Uh, the only thing she said was basically, don't believe what you hear for right now. In the meantime, sheriffs search the Copeland's house. They find bank and livestock records and several firearms, but they also find men's clothing, some with name tags that they suspect belonged to transient farmhands. Most of their clothes and stuff, you know, that's all their possessions they have, and they just don't leave them around. If they, if they move on, they take their belongings with them. Most disturbing of all, Sheriffs find a handwritten list of names on a small scrap of note paper. Next to several names is the word back. Investigators discover these men had been approached by Copeland, but had not gone through with buying cattle. They are found alive and well. Other names are marked with an X, and all those men are missing. Now, Gary Calvert suspects the unthinkable that Ray and Faye Copeland have been killing drifters, and that perhaps this list of names is a record of what they'd done. The search for bodies on the Copeland's 40-acre farm begins. In order to make the case that we needed, we would have to have the bodies. Sheriffs also dig into Ray Copeland's past. They learn that he has a long criminal record throughout the Midwest, and his favorite scam was writing bad checks. He had done exactly the same thing many, many years ago in a county over in eastern Missouri. And in that case, they found the individual who had written the bad check. He testified against Ray, and Ray was sent to the penitentiary. Police theorize that prison must have had a profound effect on Ray, and that at some point he decided he would never go back to jail again. That meant he must be very careful not to leave any more witnesses behind. The search for bodies intensifies. We spent several days executing that warrant on the Ray Copeland farm. That drew a lot of attention, as you can imagine. Under a constant media spotlight, sheriffs spend a week scouring the Copeland property, but they find nothing. Roy Cormick told us that there were bones out there, and we didn't find any. Back at the police station, Gary Calvert pushes Ray Copeland harder about the missing men. Well, you won't find no bodies. Is that right? But the worst thing about all this, Mr. Copeland, is I think a few of these people have died as a result. Well, if they have, I didn't have anything to do with it. Then the investigation suffers a devastating blow. Jack McCormick admits he lied about seeing human remains. I told them that uh, falsely to get them to investigate because I was so sure of what had taken place out here. Still, despite the setback, the evidence of bad checks, missing drifters, and the list of names is enough to justify continuing the search. And finally, all the media attention stirs up some credible leads. We get phone calls from people who would say, well, you know, Ray worked for such and such. He remodeled his barn or he fixed his fence. I was assigning deputies to follow up on each one of these phone calls. One caller says he knows of a barn Ray Copeland worked on that at one point smelt of dead animals. Deputy Paul Stegmeyer is immediately sent to search the barn. Well, all we was using, actually, it was just a steel rod. 
it goes in the ground fairly hard. If you find a place that's been disturbed and stuff, it goes in a lot easier. Doesn't matter how long ago it was disturbed and covered back up, it's still different from the rest of the ground. In an area that looks like it's been disturbed, the deputies begin to dig. It's not long before they make a grisly discovery. A body, wrapped in plastic, buried in a shallow grave, and still wearing his tennis shoes. And right beside it are two more bodies. Through dental records, they're identified as James Harvey, John Freeman, and Paul Cowart. They were all drifters and all marked with an X on the Copeland's list of names. Each of the three men had been killed by a gunshot to the back of the head. We recovered spent bullets from each of the skulls, and all three of them matched with one of the rifles that we took out of Ray's home. On October the 17th, 1989, Ray and Faye Copeland are charged with three counts of first-degree murder. Prosecutors announce they'll be pursuing the death penalty. Meanwhile, the search for bodies continues until sheriffs get a tip from the most unlikely source. Ray finds out that we've found three of these bodies. Ray said, well, I understand you found some bodies and I want to help you guys out. Ray Copeland tells sheriffs he overheard three men in a restaurant talking about how they killed a man and dumped his body down a well on a nearby farm. Say there is a guy in there? Yes, sir. Who, who's in there? I don't know that. And he's got a concrete block chain around him. Deputies are quickly dispatched to the well. So we uh, took a rope with a grappling hook on the end of it, and dropped it down in there and pulled it up a time or two, seeing if we could find anything. And one time when we pulled it up, it had a cowboy boot on it. And the cowboy boot still had what was left of the person's foot in it. So that's when we took the track hoe and the back hoe and dug down the side of it. When the body is recovered, it's identified as one of the missing men who'd prompted the whole investigation, drifter Dennis Murphy. Next, investigators search a barn just 100 feet from the well. This whole barn was completely full of big round bales like you see back in here, so we had to come in here and clear out this whole center aisle. We got down to where the hay's coming out of that one, all the way across that stall right in there, is where we found the fifth body. The body is that of Wayne Warner. Just like the other men, Warner and Murphy had been shot in the back of the head with Ray Copeland's gun. Ray and Faye Copeland are now charged with all five murders. Prosecutors build their case around the theory Ray pulled the trigger and Faye helped organize and cover up his crimes. They decide early on to split the trials. 69-year-old Faye Copeland will be tried first. In the months leading up to her trial, her defense prepares to argue that not only did Faye know nothing of her husband's scams or the alleged murders, she's also a victim of Ray Copeland's brutality. To assess her state of mind, they send her to psychologist Marilyn Hutchinson. She came as a regular therapy client brought by the deputies pretty much weekly for about nine months. She looked extraordinarily beaten down, a very, very sad, sad person. Faye Copeland would say nothing against her husband. But after several sessions and after talking to Faye's children, Marilyn Hutchinson begins to form a picture of a family dominated and controlled by Ray Copeland. He was the complete dictator. Why separate? And anyone who crossed him or for any reason that he was offended or upset, he would physically lash out at whoever was closest or whoever was on his mind. By the way, I'm sorry, well, I'm sorry, I'm getting... They'd met when Ray Copeland was 26 and Faye 19. By then, he'd already served time for forging checks. 
The two were married after just a few months, but Marilyn Hutchinson learns that Ray soon showed his true colors. Right after they were married, he refused to pay her father for some work that her father had done for him. He stole food from her parents, and he tried to rape her sister. Despite it all, Faye stuck by her husband. She always put him first. That was the nature of her life. Faye's son, Al, also suffered at the hands of his brutal father. He got mad at not being able to hammer a nail into a piece of wood. And I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. He beat me with a pair of metal calculators. I mean, that was commonplace for him. The only thing he had to do was stay out of his way. The five Copeland children left home as soon as they were old enough, but Faye stayed. You could see bruises on her, days that we would either, either come over and visit him or whatever. You could see a black eye or where he had hit her on her face or something. Not long before the trial, prosecutors offer Faye Copeland a deal. If she talks, they'll take the death penalty off the table, and she could spend just a few years in jail. But again, she denies knowing anything. We visited her quite a bit, and she would still not say anything to anyone else. Mom was afraid to death of Ray, and there wasn't nothing we boys could do anything about it. Based on Faye's therapy sessions with Marilyn Hutchinson, the defense will argue that Faye Copeland is a victim of battered woman syndrome, and that even now Ray controls her due to years of physical and emotional abuse. She had been taught for decades to not even ask him a question, let alone criticize him. That's part of what's called learned helplessness, and it's the phenomena that when you've been beaten down so much and so long and so hard that even if the gate door is left open on the concentration camp, people sometimes didn't run because they just had lost the ability to see an opportunity. On the 1st of November, 1990, Faye Copeland goes to trial and pleads not guilty. The defense are confident that with Marilyn Hutchinson's expert testimony on battered woman syndrome, they will be able to argue successfully that Faye Copeland is not accountable for the murders because she was totally controlled by her husband. The verdict will hinge on whether the jury believes it. But then there is a major setback. Because there had been paperwork filed incorrectly and because the attorney general objected, I was not allowed to testify. With the defense of battered woman syndrome ruled out, Faye Copeland's attorneys are left with very little to contradict the prosecution's evidence against her. First, prosecutors call Jack McCormick to the stand. He testifies that Faye Copeland handled the books and took care of the transients that stayed at the house. They display the drifter's clothing found hanging in the closet and a quilt Faye had made with some of it. Finally, they presented the scrap of notepaper listing the names of the murdered men, marked with an X. Crucial to the prosecution, handwriting experts established the list was written by Faye Copeland. They say it makes her just as culpable as her husband, Ray. She was Ray's bookkeeper. She had to know something was going on. There's no doubt in my mind Marilyn Hutchinson remains convinced the list does not mean Faye was involved, but she's powerless to say so at the trial. Ray was illiterate and could not write. Ray had told her to write down particular names, and sometimes he told her to put X's by them. True to form, she didn't question why they were X's. Finally, prosecutors show the jury a letter written by Faye to Ray while in jail four days after their arrest. Discussing the search on their farm, Faye wrote, nothing found, nothing gained, and that things will cool down. The prosecution argued that this is one piece of evidence that should eliminate all doubt about Faye Copeland's guilt. Marilyn Hutchinson, on the other hand, 
believes it's simply a letter from a loyal wife trying to support her husband. She continues to write to him and, and support him and encourage him in the same kind of ways that she had been trained to do so. Um, there was nothing in that note or that letter that was surprising to me. The lay jury listened to what sounded like a cover-up note and took it for that. Without Marilyn Hutchinson's expert testimony on battered woman syndrome, the evidence against Faye is overwhelming. And at no point in the trial does Faye Copeland testify that she was abused by her husband. The jury deliberates for three hours before returning their verdict. Guilty of murder in the first degree. She always said she was innocent, that she didn't know what was going on or didn't have anything to do with it. And the evidence, as far as I'm concerned, showed that she did. Faye Copeland is sentenced to death by lethal injection. On March the 7th, 1991, it's Ray Copeland's turn in court. The trial is almost an exact replica of Faye's, with overwhelming physical evidence. After a 10-day trial, the jury deliberates for just two and a half hours. They find Ray Copeland guilty on all five counts of first-degree murder. He, too, is sentenced to death. But his sentence is never carried out. Two years later, 78-year-old Ray Copeland dies of natural causes while awaiting execution. She loved him from the day they got married to the day he died. He was my love, the love of my life, my kids. I will always be a love in my heart for it. After her husband's death, Faye Copeland would still say very little but she does begin to open up about the way he treated her. In a 1999 appeal, her death sentence is commuted to life in prison based on undisclosed testimony on battered woman syndrome. Then in 2002, after serving 12 years, Faye Copeland suffers a stroke and is sent to a nursing home. She dies a year later, aged 82. I love my mom. To this day, I still love her. Did Faye Copeland write the men's names on that list because her husband told her to? Or was she keeping track of their horrific crimes? We'll never know how much she really knew or whether she participated in the murders. And there are three more drifters known to have encountered the Copelands who are still missing. There's still a possibility there's some out, out here somewhere we just don't know. And, It'd probably be an accident if anybody ever finds him.